So let me pull up uh, the Redfin data set. And go ahead and just do a little bit of cleanup like I showed you last time. Take out all the unnecessary um, columns and rows that don't help us any. And there are in this case, now we're looking at 218. That's 219 with the row, the header row, uh, data points or rows, observations. And we'll go ahead and select price as our dependent variable. We'll select a few independent variables like beds, baths, where feet, lot size, and perhaps days on market. Color those just for visual purposes only. We're going to go ahead and take these columns. I'm doing this quickly as a review, moving them over. And how you do this in Excel is entirely on you. I prefer to take the features of interest and garner this data frame from the data set. Move price over to the right because it's Y. We want to align X and Y in order. And then um, I'm going to go ahead and also impute in, uh, by using the average to fill in all the missing data. So again, for this should be a review for beds. Let's see. Let's see for each and every one of them by doing a filter on A. Do we have missing values? Yes, we do. And I think we do for all of them except for price. Maybe we don't have any for uh, days on market either. So we'll go ahead and type in average equals average. That will give us the average of each column. Probably a, a lot better and easier ways to do this. Probably do it up front. So we go with A, B, C, D. E doesn't have any. We're just gonna go ahead and move this formula over like so. And as you see here up top, where I'm highlighting it, you'll see the changes reflected for each column. So, um, Probably, I should have done that the first time. <laughs> um, so column A is 4.12. Let's round these to the nearest whole number. It wouldn't make sense to have 4.12 beds or 2.9 bats. Um, so same thing for square feet because all of these values here already express this whole number. So go ahead and do that here up top underneath number. That's the shortcut way to do that. Just move the decimal places here. Uh, so beds, I'm going to unselect all, select blanks as four, <clears throat> fill it with four rather, move it down. You got to undo the filter, come back, redo the filter. Now for beds, it's three. And over time, if you don't already, you'll learn how to move quickly through this as you navigate Excel. Column C is... What do we have here? 2518. I'm going to do the what I call the sandwich. Um, so I start with the top here, copy 2518, go to the bottom, bring it to the last observation, and then control shift up to meet the two ends like a sandwich, like the two bread pieces, and then do a control D to connect the two points and fill everything with 2518. <clears throat> now for column D, unselect all, select blanks and make this uh, 2468, like so. Oop, it won't, won't allow me to copy and paste, but that's fine, same idea. And so now we have a complete data frame from all of these observations that don't have any missing values. We can remove those um, from the right-hand side. Uh, nonetheless, to build a model, well, first we need to ensure that we have the data analysis tool pack um, present and activated within our Excel environment. So to confirm that's the case, we'll go to you know, File, Options, um, uh, Add-ins on the left-hand panel or side, and make sure to go to Manage Excel Add-ins, click on Go, make sure that you have this analysis tool pack activated or checked off, click OK. Now that we uh, have that, so we all we need to do is specify what our independent var variable range is and what our dependent variable range is, plus a few other conditions. So to do that, we'll find uh, regression on this list and click OK. Our input Y range. And remember, we want to start this very precisely, very methodically. So we'll start this from the very first observation, which includes the label. F1 all the way down to the end of F219. 
Then we carefully place our mouse into the input X range. And from there, we select the entire range. That goes from A1 to E. We hit Control Shift down. And then how do I know that we don't have any missing values? As I'm hitting Control Shift down, everything lands on the last observation. If there was a missing value somewhere in that range, it would pause at that missing value. So same idea goes through the 219th row. That includes the label. So it's really 218 observations. And because we have labels, we'll go ahead and click on labels. The confidence level is by default set to 95%. <clears throat> That's what we selected last time. It'll be interesting to see what would happen if we actually, for, for fun, selected a 99% confidence level, which would assume a alpha of 0 0.01 be actually rather interesting to see that um, so that we can look at this to different types of statistical significance. Because remember, if you want to lower your type two error, right, that means that you need to increase your alpha, actually decrease your alpha, which increases your confidence level. Uh, and a type two error is false negative. You have um, that many, false negatives if you were to tally up the different observations, break them into false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. So to minimize those, um, what we need to do, all right, let's say residuals, the residual plots. All right, so let me go ahead and click on OK. And I've never messed with the 99% confidence level, but it is exactly what I've surmised this whole time. So if we were to expand this table, Remember last time when we had a 95% here, we also had a 95% there. That was by default. So if we don't change anything and we leave a 95% confidence level intact, you would have these repeated twice like that. So lower 95, upper 95 um, would be repeated here. But because we've selected 99%, you have those new columns here. So there is a difference now. This way you can compare the statistical significance of uh, <clears throat> this p-value um, based on your, you can assume this is your alpha of 0 0.05, you can assume this is your um, alpha of 0 0.01. So you have two different thresholds for statistical significance reflected here. Um, so this is kind of where we landed, a little bit of a review. Um, R is uh, explained by the Pearson correlation coefficient R. In this case, the multiple R is pretty much an, an amalgamation of all these um, relationships at 66%. Then you move on to the R squared, which is the variation that exists between X and Y. Um, and that variation is not too bad. It's moderate at 44% when we round it. When we adjust it for all of the independent variables that we have here, and there are uh, beds, baths, square feet, lot size, and days on market, we have um, a slight drop off, which gives us 42%. The standard error is very high, but what you're gonna do, it's an Excel model. Uh, and also that we only have 209, I mean, 218 observations, so many other factors that influence the standard error, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the observation. So if we, we can pretty much take that and comp uh, confirm that this is the case. So, we have the predicted price. And what we did last time is we connected this to the actual price. So let's go ahead and copy that over. Matter of fact, let me just call this the actual price. When we subtract, when we take the actual price, subtract the residuals from it, that gives us back the predicted price. So the residuals are the, the that epsilon that we've seen in the equation. If you recall, it was um, y uh, hat is equal to beta sub zero x sub one uh, plus beta sub two x sub two. So there's beta sub zero and then you got plus beta sub one x sub one plus beta sub two x sub two plus dot 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 beta sub n x sub n plus some error turn epsilon. Those are the residuals here that you have left over. And so when you look at price and predicted price, that's the difference here, the residual. 
Now, um, <clears throat> so yeah, this is the predicted price. And when we look at these residual plots, let's move over to the right-hand side. Um, let us do a little bit of an analysis. Um, is, is what we can re reveal here in this in these relationships is the presence of or lack thereof heteroskedasticity, and and so heteroskedasticity um, lets you kind of know whether or not there's a need for a linear transformation. So as you as you look at these independent variables and try to look establish a pattern, if they begin to, if the pattern begins to fan out like so, I don't know if you can see my hands on the screen, but if it begins to fan out from one point and just kind of disperse, that uh, suggests that there's heteroskedasticity. Um, it, it, it gives you a, a kind of a funnel shape or a pattern so that the spread of these residuals increases or in some cases decreases with these fitted values. So, if these residuals spread wider in that fan-like pattern I was suggesting, um, as the predicted value increases, then what we can say is that the variance is not constant. So that suggests that the variance is heteroskedastic. And so the implication for that heteroskedasticity is that we have a violation in the assumption of constant variance in regression. And this can re really affect the reliability of the standard errors that we have and confidence intervals and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> whether or not we need a linear transformation really depends on these um, nonlinear patterns. So if you see in these residuals that there's a distinct curved or systematic pattern, um, it's basically saying that your model is not capturing the underlying relationship in an adequate way. And so um, we can say based on that, that the data can potentially benefit from a transformation. So you really do want to avoid patterns. You, you really want like a random shotgun blast of data. You want this weird look, just non-pattern kind of um, art print, if you will, because it is, in, in as we're looking at these, this is more of an art than a science, if that makes sense. The science is just understanding these conditions. And, all you're doing when you're transforming the variable is you're scaling it using the logarithm, right? So you're just taking the natural log of whatever value that would be in that column. And now it's, so like, let's say it was, for example, actual price right here is 425,000. If we were to take that as, you know, what we're gonna scale or transform. So LN, there, so now it's 12.96. So that price is scaled down to that value, but it's really the same feature. So in your model, if you were to use a log transformed feature, do not include the original and as, as you're training it, because you're really then duplicating what you already have. So you got to pick one or the other, either you use the original column or you use the transformed column, but not both. Because that would overfit, it has a potential to overfit the model if you do it that way. Thank <clears throat> you.